family of Gorilla have taken over this camp. Don't make any banana noises, they find that to be very appealing. Oh, look what they did to that Jeep. They left the lights on. I'll never get that thing to turn over.
quit talking while I'm interrupting. Out of all my cruises today, you have certainly been the most recent. As the approach of the dock, watch those arms, watch those elbows, keep them inside the boat for me, please, away from the outside. And now on the count of three, and only on the count of three, go ahead and please stand up. Three. Watch your step there, watch your head, you'll exit the same way you entered. Don't cross to that brown thing in the middle, I don't know what that is. Uh, watch your step there, watch your head. Don't be afraid to use those handrails. And finally, one last joke for all you mind readers out there. Welcome everyone, I'm Robin Roberts. While we are waiting to enter the theater for great moments with Mr. Lincoln, we'd like to tell you the story of an unlikely friendship that transformed America forever. change the course of history. Ten years before the Emancipation Proclamation was enacted, if all earthly power were given me, I should not know what to do as to the existing institution. Oh, had I the ability, and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of fighting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder.
Frederick Douglass never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was about six or seven years old. He would sleep head first in an old corn sack with his feet hanging out on cold winter nights to try and keep himself warm. Teaching the enslaved to read was illegal, so young Frederick secretly traded what little food he had in exchange for reading lessons. It just shows how much he understood how education was going to be his key to freedom. And a key to freedom it was. At the age of 20, Douglas made a daring escape and went north, settling in Massachusetts. There he soared from Orton. The one cannot be truly free, while the other is a slave. To newspaper editor, truth is of no color. And best-selling author, from that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. He was the central voice of the abolitionist movement. He had this natural gift for communication. He was eloquent. He was charismatic. There wasn't a venue, a building large enough to hold people who wanted to hear him. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Much of Douglas's irony was directed towards Washington, D.C and Abraham Lincoln, the anti-slavery president who took office just as the Civil War began in 1861. Anti-slavery is very different than being an abolitionist. It was very gradual that most anti-slavery candidates believed in the abolition of slavery. I do not suppose that ultimate extinction would occur in less than a hundred years at the least. That would have put the end of slavery in 1958. And for Frederick Douglass, that's outrageous. Mr. Lincoln is quite a genuine representative of American prejudice, and far more concerned for the preservation of slavery. Douglass was relentless in his fight for freedom, and with the steady drumbeat of the abolitionist movement in his ear, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing enslaved people in the southern states and for the first time, making it legal for all black men to fight in the Civil War. These new soldiers injected the Union Army with much needed manpower, but still, they faced discrimination and disparity. Douglas is so outraged that he makes a trip to D.C. and decides he wants to meet with Lincoln himself. To his surprise, Lincoln agreed to see him immediately. He was ushered up past all of the people that were waiting to see uh, Lincoln that day. And just imagine this visual of this black man just bounding up the steps and people are looking at him like, who is that? Lincoln begins the conversation and he says, hello, Mr. Douglas, essentially. Um, it's good finally to meet you. I've read your writings a lot. I know you've been very critical of me. Their one-on-one -on -one left a lasting impression on both men and Lincoln vowed to improve the conditions for black soldiers. My whole interview with the president was gratifying and did much to assure me that slavery would not survive the war and that the country would survive both slavery and war. A year later, it is Lincoln who needs Douglas's help. He feels he's gonna lose re-election, essentially says, you know, I need you, I think the war is going badly. Lincoln entrusted Douglas with creating a plan for aiding the escape of enslaved people from rebel territory so that they could join the Union cause. Douglas writes a detailed letter to Lincoln spelling out his vision of these special forces. He did not let me feel for a moment that there was any difference in the color of our skins. The president is a most Remarkable man. With Douglas' support, Lincoln would go on to turn the tide of the war and win re-election. The following year, Douglas returned to Washington once more to attend the inauguration. Now in this multitude of elite of the land, I felt myself a man among men. 
the first time a president devotes most of the speech to African Americans. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves. Frederick Douglass heard his words and his language in Lincoln's address. Until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. The work that he had done over so many years, he was now hearing this at a very important moment in time in the nation's history. Douglas is invited to the White House for a reception, sees Douglas enter and yells out, here comes my friend, Frederick Douglass. There is no man in the country whose opinion I value more than yours. Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. Oh, freedom. Douglas spoke truth to power, and he never stopped fighting for his people, and he understood that the struggle continued. He said, without struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln.
was the American dream, the prayer for the future. But that golden goal was not to be had without cost. The American way was not gained in a day. It was born in adversity, forged out of conflict, perfected and proven only after long experience and trial. In all of history, no man was dedicated to this dream more than the 16th president of these United States, Abraham Lincoln. Here in his own words is what he once wrote about himself. For at that time, very few people outside Illinois knew very much about this man from the prairie. I was born February 12th. 1809, in Hardin County, Kentucky. My father removed from Kentucky to what is now Spencer County, Indiana, in my eighth year. It was a wild region, with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods. There I grew up. I was large for my age, and had an axe put into my hands at once, and from that to my 23rd year, was almost constantly handling that most useful instrument. I think that the aggregate of all my schooling did not amount to one year. At 21, I came to Illinois, thought of trying to study law, or rather thought I could not succeed at that without better education. I borrowed some law books, took them home, and went at it in good earnest. In 1854, the law profession had almost superseded the thought of politics in my mind, when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused me as I had never been before. What I have done since then is pretty well known. If any personal description of me is thought desirable, it may be said I am in height, six feet, four inches nearly, lean in flesh, weighing on an average of 180 pounds, dark complexion, with coarse black hair and gray eyes, and no other marks or brands recollected. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln became president faced with the terrible threat of civil war, a thing he dreaded yet a calamity he was prepared to meet if he must. Without you, Miss, the Constitution is only a piece of paper. I know there is a God, and that he hates injustice and slavery. I see the storm coming. I know his hand is in it. If he has a place, work for me, and I think he has. I believe I'm ready, and with God's help, I shall not fail. April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter. The cannon spoke for war. Civil war, violent, devastating. Now had come the reckoning, the supreme test that would decide whether a republic founded on liberty could survive the terrible strife of men's passions. One 
One was gentle, one was kind. One was gentle, one was kind. One came home, one stayed behind. A cannonball, don't be no mind. A cannonball, don't be no mind. If you're gentle or if you're kind, you don't think of the folks behind. Hold on a beautiful morning. Hold on a beautiful Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Ten brief sentences. So simple, so direct. Abraham Lincoln had not expected his words to live beyond their temporary moment. But time and history would dictate otherwise. And so today, his Gettysburg Address is immortal. A rich and treasured part of our country's heritage. We pay tribute here, not to a man who lived a century ago, but to an individual who lives today in the hearts of all freedom-loving people. His prophetic words are as valid for our time as they were for his. And now, the skills of the sculptor and the talents of the artist will let us relive great moments with Mr. Lincoln. The world has never had a good definition of the word liberty. And the American people just now are much in want of one. We all declare for liberty. But in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. What constitutes the bulwark of our liberty and independence? It is not our frowning battlements, our bristling sea coasts. These are not our reliance against tyranny. Our reliance is in the love of liberty, which God has planted in our bosoms. Our defense is in the preservation of the spirit which prizes liberty as the heritage of all men, in all lands, everywhere. Destroy this spirit, and you have planted the seeds of despotism around your own doors. At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us with a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge 
in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring from amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all times or die by suicide. Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us nor frightened from it by the menaces of destruction to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it.
Yeah, she she left maybe like 2020, I think. Uh, Got Donald Duck. How wonderful, my friend. Sailors and remain seated throughout your voyage. 
If you wish to take underwater photos, please refrain from using a flash. Thanks and enjoy your dive. Hola, bienvenidos a nuestro laboratorio. Por su seguridad a bordo del submarino, tengan cuidado de no darse en la cabeza. Bajen cuidadosamente los escalones. Vigilen a los pequeños marineros y permanezcan sentados durante todo el viaje. Se permite tomar fotos, pero no usar flash. Gracias y que disfruten del viaje.
City Highway. Many creatures can be found commuting in this current, including the majestic sea turtle.
was no mine. Look at now, look at where the mine is. Look. Yay, now we look at